Hello everyone, my name is Rachel Moses and you are listening to the HP Leader podcast. And tonight I'm delighted to be joined by some expert speech and language therapists and I can already feel some of them cringing when I say that but they really are and I'm so grateful we're joined tonight tonight to discuss the speech and language therapy role and input of people post COVID infection. Now I do want to have a slight focus on long COVID but um, speech and language therapists here tonight were really keen that we discuss the whole spectrum of people who had suffered with COVID infection so that's what we're going to do tonight. I'm very aware it's an all-female panel I just want to put that out there but speech and language therapy is a very dominated female profession Um, so um, I can only apologize for the lack of gender diversity but um, I'm delighted to be joined by fabulous females as a feminist. So I'm going to hand over to my fabulous co-chair Sharon who said she is happy to co-chair this with me tonight as a speech and language therapist and also started this off on Twitter so over to you Sharon. Hi everyone my name is Sharon Ajay Nicol. I'm a clinical and academic speech and language therapist so I work as a senior lecturer at the University of Greenwich I'm teaching the speech and language therapy program there and then I also work in independent practice um, and I call myself a bit of a generalist, really, but the jack of all trades. But my main areas of interest are sort of adult neurology and, and voice disorders. So kind of really kind of keen to kind of be part of this discussion and see the impact of, of long COVID across both of those kind of clinical areas. But but do have a lot of kind of um, experience in dysphagia as well. So, yeah, definitely a bit of a jack of all trades for me. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon, and welcome back. We've done some podcasts before, and Sharon, you get excellent feedback from your patients. Just throw that in there as well. Um, Lorna, over to you. Hi, I'm Lorna Gambarini. I'm the voice specialist at North Cumbria Integrated Care Trust. I'm also the lead on head and neck cancer. Um, I'm interested in the whole spectrum, really, of post-COVID. I was lucky enough to become embedded into a virtual MDT back in September. And at that point, our focus was on post ICU patients, but the the emphasis has shifted. And since February, um, we've been a a virtual MDT for long COVID patients. Um, And it's really, really useful to be embedded within that. I work with psychology, respiratory physio, neuropsychology, living well coaches, and it's made such a difference just having that joint approach to the patient so we we know where everybody's going because we're all learning all the time about this every every time we have a meeting something new comes up thank you Lorna and you've also joined us on previous podcasts so I'm delighted to have you back and you are just a huge example of the power of speech and language therapists working remotely and also face to face so thank you for all of your hard work and efforts previously um, Avisha coming to you next Hi, my name is Avish Darinani and I'm a speech and language therapist at Imperial College um, Trust and working on the Airways and ENT team. I had the privilege of working on ICU during the first surge um, at another trust and following that um, on the second surge at Imperial Trust as well. And so I've seen the very acute phase of COVID. Um, but I've also had the opportunity of participating in the COVID, um, post-COVID tracheostomy clinic at Imperial. So seeing patients at sort of one and three months post um, discharge from hospital. Um, but also very excited to hear about uh, from my colleagues, the impact of COVID in the community and sort of the longer term um, trajectory. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to be on here today. Thank you. And I definitely can't wait to hear a little bit more about your experiences for sure. Real breadth of experience there um, throughout the pandemic. Thank you. Fiona. Hi, my name is Fiona Gillies and I'm a speech and language therapist at two hospitals. I'm employed by UCL and I work there one day a week at the Royal ENT Hospital, but I'm also the clinical lead for voice and upper airways work at the Whittington Hospital in uh, North London. So the majority of my involvement and work has been as the rehab pathway for long COVID. So I was not involved in the acute phases, apart from maybe just um, supporting my colleagues who were working with patients on the wards, but remotely. 
And my work at the moment has been very much focused on rehabilitating those generally young people in their 20s, 30s and 40s who weren't hospitalised and who have got long standing COVID issues with voice change, breathlessness and upper airways irritation. So I'm really delighted in, to be invited to come today and to also hear about some of the work that happened in the acute phases and to sort of add, add the back part to what's happening now. So yeah, thanks for inviting me. And you've just touched on that really important point, Fiona, because um, your contribution in this can be to really showcase what we aren't hearing about. It's some of those complications and problems that are coming to light from the non-hospitalised patients. Um, so really keen to hear your experience as well. So thank you for joining us. It, but it was very short notice. <laughs> so thank you. And last but not least, Gemma, over to you. So I'm also um, a clinical specialist speech therapist based at Imperial College Healthcare Trust, like Avisha, working with her in airways and ENT. Um, although I am currently on secondment doing my PhD with the NIHR, so um, I'm kind of employed by Imperial College London for now. Um, and my PhD focuses on airway stenosis, which, as we know, can be a kind of um, a factor for those patients who were intubated or had long term tracheostomies within COVID. So it's kind of become part of my PhD without me quite intending that at the beginning. Um, and I've also been involved in the COVID tracky clinics that Avisha mentioned. Um, I should also say I'm also the Royal College of Speech Language Therapy um, rep for the Long COVID Task Force, the NHS England Improvement have um, developed. I haven't been to a meeting yet because they they're on hiatus at the moment and they've only just put me forward. Um, but I've been involved with college um, as a um, COVID-19 advisor since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and so I guess I've got quite an overview. I was also redeployed in the first surge as a bed buddy. So I was working shifts on ICU um, and working with some of the tracheostomy patients when I could um, as a clinician as well. Um, I think that's everything. Thanks, Gemma. You've got your fingers in pies there. Love it. <laughs> I think that's why you're here tonight. <laughs> you had several tags on the tweet. So I'm going to start with you, Gemma, if that's OK, and then come down to you, Avisha. So in if I think back to probably about this time last year, actually, maybe a, a couple of weeks down the line, we very quickly realised that a lot of our ICU patients um, were developing a higher incidence of laryngeal injury or complications, particularly post extubation, um, and particularly with airway swelling, some stenosis, um, you know, things that we see in the ICU, but maybe not on the same scale or with the same severity. Now, if we think back to that moment in time and then what we've continued to see through this pandemic, and it's actually quite well documented now, isn't it, through some of the case reports and some of the work that came out, the Manchester team, um, and also what our colleagues um, across the country have been seeing. So Gemma, maybe just a reminder of what things you guys are seeing as speech and language therapists in that acute phase for the hospitalized patients. I think you've summarised it pretty well already. Um, you know, there does seem to be a higher incidence of laryngeal edema. Um, there's certainly problems with that kind of swelling pattern, um, possibly an increased incidence of um, vocal fold paresis, if not complete palsy. Um, and, and there is always the risk of subglottic stenosis. And ultimately, if you're going to intubate a patient for a very long time, as we know that COVID patients often are, and there is a delay to the tracheostomy process as well, although, and then the, the tracheostomy can be in place for a really long time. We, we know that that can lead to airway problems. And, and as you say, Rachel, it, it definitely has over the past year become really clear that that is happening. Um, what is positive, but I think in general, most of the studies that have been published and certainly just from the sort of subjective data that's out there as well, is that the majority of patients are being successfully decannulated with awareness of those issues and with management of things like edema with steroids and all of the things and any ENT involvement as early as possible. Again, that was problematic at the beginning of the pandemic because there was a limit on whether patients could be scoped or not, but most I think most kind of acute facilities now have the correct um, PPE procedures in place to make sure that scoping can happen, whether it's from ENT or from speech therapy or from both, ideally. 
um, and that kind of all of the issues like the dysphagia that can develop as a result of that just from deconditioning and the edema are being managed. One little shout out that I definitely want to make though is that we are now seeing in our airways follow-up clinic the patients who were successfully decannulated but now months later are developing subglottic stenosis or even posterior glottic stenosis as a result of scar tissue buildup. Um, and we know that within the first 12 months post intubation, that is when there's a real risk of that developing, even if they were kind of coping fine and have gone home. So to any colleagues out there who see these patients as outpatients or notice any kind of pattern of stride or breathing problem and they haven't been scoped, just make sure that you get them into CENT as soon as possible. Um, because, you know, we've had a couple of patients in quite a, a unfortunate state by the time they've got to see us and they've actually there's a gentleman who's ended up back with the tracheostomy again um so it's just to be aware is there anything you want to add avisha because i know that you obviously see these people too um yeah i mean i think Gemma, you've, you've pretty much touched on everything that we've um encountered during the the acute phase um, you know, these patients were intubated for anywhere between three to five weeks, which is which is really quite extensive. And we know from the literature that patients who are intubated for anything beyond even 48 hours are at risk of dysphagia, at risk of laryngeal edema, at risk of laryngeal injury. Um, so if you can imagine for being intubated for a period of three to five weeks, the risks that that um, are laid upon them and then and then having a tracheostomy subsequent to that. Um, Patients were sort of tracheostomized for probably about roughly, I would say, on average two weeks um, before we could decannulate them. But as Gemma mentioned, the great thing is that we were able to decannulate every patient, at least every patient that was that we that that we saw. Um, we were able to to decannulate prior to sending them home. Um, not to say that there weren't complications around that with laryngeal injuries, um, with dysphagia, with voice issues, um, and I think. As Gemma mentioned, part of the challenge was not being able to scope them in those in that early stage. So to assess where the, where the issues were was very very difficult, and troubleshooting obviously was much harder. Um, and we really had to rely on our clinical skills to be able to do this. Um, but nonetheless, we you know I think the dysphagia, although in its very acute stages, where it could have been quite significant for a lot of patients. Um, we tended to see that once they just turned that corner, they were able to make quite a good recovery with their swallowing. And majority of patients we were able to discharge um, from hospital managing pretty much at their baseline. Um, but not to say that this doesn't uh, highlight sort of other issues that come up down the line, which I'm sure we'll, we'll cover down a, a little bit later. Um, but it was a very acute set of symptoms that, that these patients presented with at the time. Um, so it's interesting to then see what they're, how they present sort of one and three months down the line, 12 months as we're seeing more data emerge now. Um, but at that point, it seemed like very acute symptoms that, that, we, were, that we were dealing with with regards to laryngeal edema, um, voice changes and swallowing. I think one of the things I want to maybe get people to think about is the pathophysiology element of this. So normally with ICU, we think of it being more trauma related, but you know, we've got a big bit of plastic in the throat, in the in the windpipe, and or you've got a bit of plastic here. And it's everything, isn't it? The rehab and everything that comes with that and the actual, obviously, um, procedure itself. What we're dealing with here with the respiratory virus of this pathophysiology, if we think about everything, the cytokine storm, the mediation, the after effects, um, the pro-inflammatory phase of this virus and how that can be so prolonged. And that's why we see as soon as they're out of that inflammatory phase, then the tracheas are coming out because you've mediated the storm. Um, it's, I think it's then what happens when, and we'll come onto this with the long COVID, other COVID patients we're seeing down the line, is these relapses people are having and these crash and burns. And it's like, is there then another pro-inflammatory state that then causes another airway response? And I think for me, we just don't know. But if, if the listeners start to think about that as we talk through this next few steps, I think that might be helpful in terms of understanding why, because you think it's not a mechanical problem. So there's 
there's no dysphagia so what's wrong with the airway like in it it's I think that's what a, at a basic level people might think but it's not about the mechanics it's about the stuff we'll talk about so Lorna I want to come into you first and then Sharon and then Fiona definitely but Lorna you beautifully just explained there your role over the past 12 months we've been seeing some you have been seeing some of these patients for a year now um do you want to talk us through some of the um longer term challenges or um or problems patients are presenting with yeah so i mean now i'm seeing some post icu patients who have been in icu during the third wave but the majority of them are non-hospitalised ones that are coming through. And there doesn't seem to be any great correlation between how severe their COVID was in the first place. So sometimes I'm seeing patients and ask about what their COVID was like and they're not people who had a chronic cough that went on and on and on. Um, but the patients we're seeing are presenting very much a picture as a whole of being severely fatigued having problems with shortness of breath, having brain fog. And then from a speech therapy point of view, what I'm seeing is some voice problems, although again, I think as somebody else said, they don't always recognize as a voice problem, um, but very much these persistent laryngeal symptoms where people have got a sense of globus and huge levels of irritation. So lots of throat clearing going on. Um, but I think as well, as well as all that irritation that's there, I'm very aware that a lot of these patients have got very high levels of stress and anxiety, which we know affects the larynx. Um, there's a lot of the patients who, there, I mean, there are patients who had underlying health conditions before, which maybe affected how they were living, but a lot of them didn't, or they had underlying health conditions that didn't particularly impact on their lives. And, a lot of people are saying, I kind of, I've lost who I am, I've lost myself. Um, and just trying to get back to who they are and coping with all these other symptoms is giving them such high levels of stress and anxiety and such low mood that that is something else I think that is impacting on, on the larynx, as well as all this um, ongoing um, hypersensitivity, I would say, is, is the main issue which is impacting on some of them from a swallowing point of view as well but again it's not they're not what we would call major swallowing problems but they obviously are to, to, to these patients because swallowing's not just a mechanical thing it is it's a whole it's it's got lots of social and um uh, emotional context to it um and it it just seems to have this it just seems to be this persistent laryngeal but and pharyngeal irritation that is causing people maybe low level problems from our point of view but very high level problems from their point of view absolutely and i think it, you've mentioned the the pharyngeal aspect but the oral pharyngeal aspect as well which will come into linking into the fatigue side of things as well and i think the social construct you've just mentioned there is really important as well because this is massive overlap into the nutritional side of things we've been talking about the psychological the psychosomatic so this is for me where sometimes a little bit um i think speech and language therapy might be misunderstood in terms of the role as well so thank you for bringing that up now sharon um you mentioned that you are an independent speech and language therapist and you mentioned in the pre-chat about how your patient population or your client population has changed so do you want to talk to us about what you're seeing yeah um absolutely and i think links a lot similar to what Lorna was just um, describing. Um, so I get a lot of clients who are coming through what would be sort of like a voice referral type of kind of process of perhaps having gone to a private ENT consultation because they're having maybe gone to their GP with sort of throat issues, irrit irritation, cough, been, been told they need to see ENT, but perhaps have found that the way is quite lengthy um, or so, um, have, some of them have had private ENT consultations, some of them have, have had their NHS but then have had been um, referred to speech and language therapy and at that point felt that they needed to seek private because the wait was so long. But in terms of the presentation, what they're describing, it's a lot of kind of this kind of description of running out of air. There's a breathlessness issue that kind of that gets described in different ways. Short, I feel short of breath, I feel like I'm running out of air when I'm talking. 
I feel like someone's strangling with me, me when I'm talking, I can't finish my sentences. This kind of breathlessness impacting on kind of their ability to kind of sustain long, long speech, long periods of speaking. There's a lot of that that then that then transpires, you know, that they they also presenting with hoarseness because I guess that's obviously going to present with additional strain that you then put on your voice, you know, to try and push your voice without that good breath support. So they're kind of coming through with kind of voice type issues, but linked a lot to breathlessness, but also a lot of fatigue is with that. So you're not always sure whether it's a breathlessness issue or fatigue that's contributing, but definitely they can't, there's some breath, breath support issue. Um, and then um, some are coming with swallowing, self-referring for swallowing issues, um, but tending to be fairly much. So nobody that I've seen has been hospitalized for, for COVID. Um, any sort of my long COVID referrals, they've all been non-hospitalized ones, um, mostly had it fairly mildly. Um, many didn't have the classic symptoms of um, kind of cough or breathlessness at the time they had COVID, but, they, but then they're kind of having it with the kind of the long COVID symptoms. Um, I should have, yes, yeah, so some of them are reporting kind of come through with more swallowing, like the globus, things are sticking in my throat, problems with swallowing solids, um, problems kind of um, with constant irritation in their throats, co chronic cough. And then, so there's, there's, there's that size, there's a lot of sort of the laryngeal stuff, but then I have had also some very unusual kind of, sort of the more kind of neurological symptoms. So um, when there, there has been some discussion about the sort of word finding and this kind of cognitive fatigue, brain fog type issue, which is leading to people to have problems with concentration or, you know, or um, kind of, you know, being able to kind of find words that people have again self-referred for sometimes or just kind of contacting me for advice maybe just like, is this am I just going mad is is this something you've heard of with people that have gone had often people just seeking a little bit of validity like is this because they've not had that kind of they've gone to their GP who hasn't really been able to kind of you know, give them that kind of oh I've, yeah I've heard of that before so there's a lot of that's brain fog description and then interestingly I've had two people with kind of acquired um disfluency so stammers that have come on which I only when I, they came through did I start doing a bit of reading and see that it isn't completely unheard of but definitely you know um quite a difficult one to kind of understand I mean there's one person who did have a, 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 a stammer as a child and it seems to be exacerbated in this kind of long COVID trajectory but one who's never never had a stammer who um, has come through and and that seems to be something that is you know, in discussions with other, other SLTs is something. So it's, it's just really broad. And I think what I'm finding is that they're just not necessarily knowing because they've not been hospitalized, haven't kind of got the, the kind of links in with um, different members of the MDT. They're just not, not always knowing where to go. Sometimes just needing a bit of reassurance, feeling a bit silly, like is, I didn't really have my COVID that bad. So do you think it could be? And just not wanting to always go down the kind of GP route, you know, just sometimes it's just that, that kind of question that I think you should go to see an ENT or I think you should go and, you know, so, um, but definitely quite a broad spectrum of, of presentations that encompasses the kind of things that you'd expect and some of the kind of slightly more unusual things as well. Thank you. I mean, absolutely fascinating, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. I think a, a lot of the time with the long COVID patients, it's about validation. And it's about validating people's symptoms. And sometimes we can't explain symptoms. I mean, viral illnesses can present with these really weird and wonderful um, lingering effects, if you like. Um, and if you think, again, back to the pathophysiology, um, that's kind of understandable. We've actually got a neurologist um, speaking on the full day on Saturday for this reason that you said, because some of these are unexplained neurological symptoms. But Fiona, I could see you agreeing furiously there with um, everything Sharon was saying and uh, a touch at the beginning about the, some of the patients that you're seeing. Um, so again, do you want to kind of just come in there with your thoughts? Yeah, and I'm very grateful, I was going to say, to be last, because actually I've got to listen to all of my esteemed colleagues talking about things that chime so much with where I'm at. I think... Um, one thing I found really interesting, just as a slight aside, is the way that this, uh, the COVID situation has forced us, I think, as speech and language therapists to look again at our pathways. So I've traditionally always worked in voice therapy and we've always been under the guise that we have to take a near nose and throat referral or at least a laryngeal examination in order to see any patient 
because we need to know exactly what it is within their throat that we're treating. And Avisha picked up on this earlier, that sense that as clinicians, we're having to rely on our clinical skill set to listen to voices and put that together with what we know from our years of experience. And now I found I'm getting a lot of referrals for, I'm seeing mainly the long COVID sufferers, the non-hospitalized, generally 20 year olds, 30 year olds, 40 year olds, as Lorna said, those people who at the time, and also Sharon said it, might've had quite mild symptoms, probably maybe had a little bit of a cough. A lot of them didn't even have the breathlessness at the time. The breathlessness has started as a kind of delayed function and I'm seeing those at the moment who are mainly from the first surge. So the May, um, sorry, March, April sort of population that I'm coming, I'm getting at the moment. So a lot of my referrals are actually coming through from the respiratory clinics and from the, um, from the long COVID clinics, which is interesting because I'm, I'm finding fewer patients are coming through with voice disorders, bizarrely, because the literature seems to say it's going to be around about 25% of post COVID sufferers that have voice problems. Interestingly, of those I'm seeing that do have the voice disorders, it's not constant. So just going back to what you said, Rachel, if you think about how COVID enters the body through the ACE2 receptors prevalent in the upper airways, the inflammatory kind of response that perhaps was there in the acute phases has eased off perhaps now. And so I'm seeing people who've got dysphonia that seems to coincide with fatigue effects. So when their breath support reduces because they've got this sort of post-exertional fatigue and they've got this boom and bust kind of cycle of fatigue, their dysphonia gets worse. So I've been able to use my clinical skills and say to some of these people, well, I'm fairly confident this is not a, a laryngeal um, pathology because it's fluctuating. Because when you're better and your fatigue is better or not there and your breath support is better and you're feeling more like yourself pre-COVID, you don't have dysphonia. But the dysphonia has become almost in a way the sort of the lesser part of the, of the population that I'm seeing. I'm seeing more or less those that have the upper airways irritation, as Lorna spoke about, the sort of the cough, the irritation, the, um, the throat clearing. And those who I might put in a population of kind of, um, it's, it's a less popular term, but sort of a muscle tension dysphagia. So where there isn't actually anything really going the wrong way, there's no overt signs of aspirational penetration. But as you've said, you know, it's sticking. It feels like the stuff there. And they are making changes to their diet and their lifestyle as a result of it. And it seems to be linked with an upper airways constriction. General just, you know, it's a shared part of the anatomy where the food and drink goes past the airway. So actually, if it's irritated and generally sensitive, then it's no surprise that when it goes past that part, that it stimulates that sensitivity again. So I suppose one thing I was really keen to sort of express to colleagues out there, particularly colleagues in, in voice who understand about the larynx and the laryngeal hypersensitivity, that I think we've got such a lot we can offer as part of long COVID recovery in terms of helping to desensitize the larynx. Um, but also some of the work I've been doing is really around upper airways breathlessness. And I think stuff I'm seeing is not that patients are short of breath in the sense of, you know, they're not wheezing, um, all of their lung functions normal, they're sit to stand test is done by the physios is normal, their oxygen saturations are normal. They're just telling me their work of breathing is disrupted. So they feel like they're working harder to breathe in the way that we'd expect of a sort of breathing pattern dysfunction, that sort of disorder. And I very much focused on saying to these particularly sort of 20, 30s and 40 year olds, this, you're not making this up. Because I think there are some people who feel like, am I making this up? Is this in my head? Is this... And I've been saying to them, COVID is an insult to your body. It's put your body under immense amounts of stress and pressure, like a physiological stress. And I think that is what's happening with your breathing. It's your body is just under stress, almost like that kind of flight or fight response. Sorry, flight or fight response. Like, the, you know, where I think that sort of response mechanism has got amped up. And so they're feeling breathless more easily. And we know that it affects the autoimmune system anyway. So they're feeling breathless much more easily. And I'm relying on some of the kind of traditional voice exercises to retrain abdominal breath support, reduce constriction here. As Lorna said, that work on um, desensitizing the larynx. I'm drawing on all those aspects of my speech and language therapy role to apply that to this population. And the great, most rewarding thing is, is it works. And these people often get better relatively quickly within two or three sessions. And I think a lot of what is really important is reassurance, is education and reassurance. Because I know there's the Your COVID Recovery website that people can go to, and I certainly do signpost them to that. 
but I think it's been really helpful or the feedback I've had is that there's someone there to say you're not making this up there is a mind and body link yes but there's more to this than that and your your body's under shock from having this awful virus and these are real symptoms and and we can make them better so yeah Thanks, Fiona. Sharon, I'm giving you a pre-warning, then I'm going to come on you to gear the next question, because we've asked, you've covered so much of kind of the, the things in my head that I felt we needed to cover, including the link of, is there a link from the SLT side of things? And by that, we could talk about communication, swallow, voice, like this is a whole umbrella Um but between those so with severe illness require hospitalization and not, and it doesn't seem to be that there's that causative link here. So that's number one. Number two, the translation um, certainly may be one of the reasons I do these podcasts is because it's a great learning opportunity for me. It's the absolute link and correlation between um, the fatigue factors the post viral factors that we see in other post viral illnesses but actually how it's all interlinked with nutrition with the cognitive aspects with the fatigue with the vocational rehab um and let's face it everything that's very poorly funded and resourced in our healthcare system um so what what i'm trying to get at with this is the so what factor and what can we do? So the long COVID clinics are designed as a one-stop shop. Um, it's a diagnostics. So a lot of the time you might, if you're lucky, you'll have like CT scans, VQ scans, pulmonary function tests, bloods, um, you know, and if any of them show anything up, you might go for secondary tests. Then you come into this clinic and they say, this is what you've got because we're going to diagnose it because we can see it and it's a problem and that this is going to treat it. But then you've got all the other stuff, haven't you? This stuff and unless someone asks a question or you've, you know, you're clearing your throat a lot there. Okay, do you want to do odd? Had you noticed changes in your voice? Or this is why I love the fatigue diaries, like you said, because you can start to track about when people do. The nutritional side of things, like I mentioned in the pre-chat about people modifying their diet because of fatigue or because of that, the oral stage is so tiring for them. Um, and then that might cause behavioral changes that might then have longer term impacts. And the socializations of Lorna, you said about not going out for food and not being able to go out to eat. And so the role of speech and language therapy in this um like where does it lie but i want to park the post icu patients because as you all know we need slts in those clinics as a standard properly funded full-time roles everything but like where where is it is it fiona the referral pathways for me when they exist for speech and language therapy it's transformational because you've got a referral pathway sharon your patients don't have that they don't have nothing like that that's why they're coming to you lorna you guys have modified your pathways to meet the needs of this patients and then Gemma and Avisha like you've got this kind of you've adapted your existing specialist clinics to include so that's a really broad question but who maybe Gemma if I come into you first back to you and Avisha to kind of say this is what we think needs to happen for this population of patients and then we can start to get some meaningful action around this as as well in terms of what can we advise people I think one of the really key things for me is that you need to, as you've already pointed out, ask the right questions, but you also need to ask the right questions at the right time for patients. And one of the unfortunate things with an assessment clinic where you come in on a particular day and you see a huge set of specialists potentially, whether or not speech and language therapy is there, and you have lots of tests. If on that particular day, that particular symptom isn't aggravating you too much, or if the question isn't asked, like phrased correctly, or I don't know, you haven't returned to work yet. So you don't know that you're going to really struggle over Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting with your voice or with your breathlessness, or you haven't been in a really stressful situation that might potentially aggravate some of those symptoms, or as Lorna kind of said about the the sort of social aspects of dysphagia you you haven't been out for a meal because no one can go out well we can can now but you know we haven't been able to go out for a meal you're 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 putting the onus on the patient to know exactly what they need support with on one day and that for me is a really flawed system 
I don't know necessarily what the answer is, but I think one of the things I really value in the clinic that I work in is that because we're a tertiary service and we're kind of a, a kind of final point for patients, they have access to us whenever they need us. So they can be fine and we can leave them with contact details, with support networks and just say, look, great, things are all right at the moment, but if anything changes, just come back to us. And it's that flexibility. I think platforms like the Your COVID Recovery that Fiona mentioned are brilliant, but again, they're putting the onus on the patient to re rehabilitate themselves. And don't get me wrong, I know like in terms of self-efficacy, it's incredibly important for patients to have that control and that awareness that they can make changes that will improve their condition. However, as has also been referenced, particularly with long COVID, if you're not really feeling like you're being believed, that your symptoms are kind of not proper and not real, and then you're being left with like internet resources to support yourself, that's probably not going to make you feel better. And it's certainly not going to support your recovery. You need that contact with humans, therapists, whoever, to actually help you problem solve your way through. Because you might well know the right techniques. You know, you may well practice yoga and actually have a, a baseline understanding of good breathing. But if no one puts that together for you, it's, it's not going to help. So for me, it's flexibility and adaptability in the pathway itself and in the if assessment and kind of management process. And that is something that I think we do really struggle with. And I, and I, like I said, I don't know what the answer is, but I think for speech therapy particularly, are, we can cover so much and we can support so much, but we just need to be flagged at the right times. And sometimes the patient might not know it's the right time. And then a couple of weeks later, they'll suddenly be like, oh, this, this actually is a problem. I don't know if anybody else has anything else to add from that perspective. Can I, I, I think spoke to a patient today, just very briefly, who had that at the time, I kept asking her, do you have problems? Do you have problems? Do you have problems? She kept saying no. And then eight months down the line, she's come back to me. I had a session with her this afternoon. She said, yeah, everyone actually says my voice has changed. And I realised that my throat's, I'm clearing my throat all the time. I think, yeah, wrong questions, are right questions asked at the wrong time. But anyway, Sharon, sorry to interrupt. No, not at all. And I think it's about, because we're a fairly small profession and we're not necessarily in all the, the clinics and, and whatnot I think it's also about that kind of that awareness about the breadth of what we can support with to our colleagues who do who might be seeing with people that it doesn't have to be the a classic symptom per se and, and this, is, this is hard because obviously you know having you don't want to get like every referral under the sun in your you know a speech and language office is going to get overwhelmed but it's also just kind of the, just the, the nuances of some of what we do I think sometimes get lost and people think oh they, they didn't say specifically they were choking on fluids or they didn't you know it, it wasn't that they were coughing on it and so our, our kind of role it kind of can sometimes it can be sort of put in these little pockets of it's got to be like aspiration or it's got to be and I think some of the answers on us is you know to kind of be educating our colleagues that are, are kind of maybe more frontline or you know doing some of the assessments about kind of some of the more nuanced kind of descriptions that people might give or kind of what to look out for as well so that they they don't get missed I think if you if I most of the time if they're speaking to a speech and language therapist yes it might be the wrong time but we're obviously gonna know how to phrase things kind of know the examples to give and things but if they happen to be seeing um an OT or a physio who perhaps you know doesn't ask a specific kind of question kind of too directly or you know do you have this it it, it might be that those kind of things are slipping through as well and I so I think you know there's this we're doing great in terms of this COVID has, has allowed SLT to be much more kind of we have had a lot more kind of exposure and things but I think there is still some lack of understanding about the, the breadth of issues that we can support with so I think that education is a big part of it as well. Yeah for me it's, we're seeing this in complex breathlessness so people just don't link that airway to breathlessness it's the first way you get you, your breath in isn't it so and I you've hit the nail on the head there and it's about the delicate questioning it's the same with the, some of the other more specialist therapies and it's how we get around that if you like because even if we created a hundred a thousand specialist SLT jobs and if a long COVID clinic was actually going to provide therapy we just don't have the resource to put in there and if we do we're Robin Peter to pay Paul so for me, it's about having the right skill in the right place. I don't know where that is yet in long COVID. I really don't. I know where it is in post-ICU syndrome for people who may have had COVID as well. 
but yeah and it's about contextualizing that now Lorna I know you want to come in there um because as well for me it's around the speeches have kind of done that themselves as well because of the significant lack of funding it's like we can only see it if you've got a dysphagia if you've got a swallow problem and if you're dysphagic and oh no we can't see for communication of voice because you have to go and see the voice you know we've done this to ourselves because we haven't got the funding to see everyone so we'll have to have a remit so again I don't know what the answer is but it's yeah. kind of yeah it's this is why the change in pathways and Lorna your work coming down to you has been so transformative because it shows what you can do if you're allowed and have the time to do it. Yeah yeah I mean I think I mean I agree with Sharon it is all about education and it, it depends where you are for doing the educating and it's interesting hearing about other long COVID clinics where, and, and I'm aware that there's this model where people go and see all the consultants in a day. And I, I don't know why you would do that to patients who are absolutely fatigued in the first place. And our clinic is just not set up like that. We have GP referrals in, the referrals are triaged by respiratory physios. And if it looks like they need respiratory consultant um, input, then they will go there and then be sent off to you know, cardiology or wherever from there. They're not going to be sent to ENT from there because it's already been agreed that I'm the person who's best placed to know who needs to go to ENT because I know better than the respiratory um, consultant does. Um, and then everybody else comes to our virtual MDT to, to discuss. And I know just from a conversation I had um, actually with our psychologist who's taking part on, on Saturday, um, she's learned so much about speech therapy um, I've learned so much about what she does from a psychology point of view just from being in that setting. But if people don't know what we do, they're not going to know how to refer to us. And the more we're going on, the, you know, as the, as the months have gone on, people now are aware of the things to say to me. Do you think this is an, an appropriate person for you to see? And they might not have been, you know, sort of two months ago, but now they are. Um, and what um, Rachel's referring to in terms of how I'm working is I've, I've essentially been shielding at home for the last year. And there, there are moves to get me back into the hospital somehow or other, but um, I've done all of this virtually. Um, I've done it all through, mostly through video consultations, most uh, some of it by, by phone consultations. Um, so there, there are ways and means round about it. Um, Love yeah. that. And on... Oh, go on, go on, Sharon. No, it's oh. fine. I, I'm, I'm just, I can't imagine how a COVID clinic works the way ours doesn't. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems to work so well for the patients. Do you know, I was going to say the dietitians last night said it's almost like we could have this central hub where people who are picked up in these clinics have the problems and then they're just going with whole virtual model. Your, diagnostic, your diagnostics will still need to be done to some degree, but I love that concept of centralising to get on top of things and give people the right support. Um, Sharon, did, did you want to come in there, Sharon? No, no, I was just going to say how fantastic it sounds, like, you know, look where Lorna's working, you know, and just that, yeah, just, yeah, I was just commenting, really. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Does, Avisha, did you want to come in there? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, of course we see such a spectrum of patients and. I, I can comment from sort of the, the early months um, following discharge from ICU. And I think as clinicians, it's really important for us to recognize that these patients have shifting priorities and it's, it's important for us to recognize where in their recovery pathway they are. Um, so obviously very early on from discharge, their primary symptoms and challenges are probably still going to be things like fatigue and breathlessness and they're probably not recognizing those more subtle issues that they might be struggling with around their swallowing or around their voice um, till it becomes a problem as Gemma says and it's for us to be able to pick up on those subtleties and, and almost making that link for them um, so if they are struggling with breathlessness and fatigue using that as an opportunity to maybe probe a little bit more um, around some perhaps some of the other subtle difficulties that they are having um, and then being able to support provide that support and education reassurance to them at that time um, because they may not be in that state to recognize those issues but if we can almost preempt that um, help them preempt it and and provide that reassurance and certainly I've noticed 
seeing patients between one month and three months post COVID or post discharge, you could see that change in symptoms that they would report. Um, and that was a real learning curve for me as well, just in terms of actually, can I preempt this when I see these patients early on and say, and just probe a little bit more in, in asking them questions, actually, are you struggling with this? Because they might leave hospital managing a normal diet, but actually, is their swallow 100% normal? Are they still taking that little bit longer to have their meal? Are they still feeling a little bit breathlessness, a little bit breathless when they're eating? Are they feeling fatigued? Are they taking an hour to finish a meal as opposed to say 20 minutes? And all of this has an impact on their quality of life. They're not at their baseline, even though we box them in to, oh, well, they don't have a true dysphagia, but actually they are still struggling. Um, so it's picking up on those more sort of subtle issues around, um, around, around sort of speech therapy related concerns um, and trying to identify that in the clinic and then just reassuring them. And I found that if you just say to these patients, actually, this is really normal, what you're experiencing, suddenly that's all that they need. They don't need anything. They're like, oh, okay, well, it's not just me. It's no, this is, this is part of the recovery process. Um, and you know, we're seeing this across the board. And sometimes just saying that is enough for them to just feel, okay, I get this. We just need to wait this out a little bit more. Um, and then as Gemma says, you know, safety netting them as well, knowing that they can come back when, uh, when they need to. Uh, great, love that. Now, what, what I think would be really helpful to start wrapping this up is to have some signposts. Now, the problem with the data we're collecting is you can only collect the data, you know, you want to collect so when I talked in the when I tried to do a little bit more research before the podcast in terms of what is the incidence of you know airway issues swallow um the, the, everything's focused around this horse voice as an outcome or as a question marker so um think about the people that are watching this in terms of the therapists or doctors or nurses that may be seeing these patients as a first contact in the clinic because they've got an objective measurement to do a sit to sign a six minute walk test pulmonary function test and you know what, whatever it is what kind of probe and this isn't to re replace speeches obviously we would have a speechy there but what kind of questions can you ask him what can you advise so the big things are always SLTs would always say like about voice quality and about hygiene and about then moving on to specific swallow questions um modifications because this is the thing with behavior modification people are modifying they don't even know like you said it might be other family members telling them oh god you're taking ages to eat your food now or you're always leaving half a plate or weight loss or so yeah who wants to kick off and then people can come in with um, words of wisdom. I mean, I would say um, that also tapping into how people feel in their throat, because I think it's one thing to sort of ask them what they what they're able to do, if you like, you know, in terms of swallow or you know, can they, how are they getting on with the, with the meal or how long it's taking. But because some of the symptoms are more that kind of sens sensory element, I think um, you know, some questioning around does your throat feel any different are you getting any any irritation in your throat that kind of questioning I think will be really help, helpful to tap into this thing that's not necessarily a hoarse voice per se or something that's particularly tangible but something that is still um potentially gonna then you know help open up some further kind of um questioning about what else might be going on thank you Fiona I just was going to, it's just occurred to me that maybe we need to be thinking about these populations as very slightly differently. So the population that have been in hospital perhaps need a particular set of questions around, probably more around dysphagia, those who've been intubated, particularly those who've had tracky, more weighted towards the kind of mechanical issues and also sensory issues and inflammatory issues. So asking them about globus and asking them about breathlessness and asking them about dysphagia and potentially hoarseness if they've been intubated for a long time. But those that are coming through from the GPs that are the non-hospitalized population, they're often much more subtle signs. It's the loss of vocal power, um, vocal fatigue, um, globus sensation, less often dysphagia symptoms in this population, um, but more often around, yeah, voice getting tired, 
and the breathlessness or the feeling of aching or tightness or constriction. So they almost perhaps need to be separated. I don't know what my colleagues think of that. I think that's reasonable. I think another important question to ask is kind of what's going on in terms of the anosmia and the agesia, so the loss of taste and the loss of smell um, in both cohorts of patients, actually, because um, I think that's one part where there's crossover. And I don't know whether um, Avisha and Lorna would agree with this with head and neck backgrounds as well. But for me, a lot of these patients really remind me of those post radiotherapy people that you see that are just really struggling to even want to eat and drink because they can't taste anything or it tastes different and it tastes weird. And I think that we do have a real role to play there as well. And I think that that can, that can massively factor in nutrition. And obviously we know that nutrition is so key to recovery. So again, there's these kind of really subtle signs that aren't necessarily obviously speech therapy, but we have expertise to be able to support with as well. And just one other thing to flag that we haven't mentioned um, is that there will be a set, subset of patients who have reflux, however much you kind of think that reflux impacts on these, these symptoms or not, if that's not being managed, whether ideally through behavioral changes and kind of diet adapt, adaptations and things like that, um, that will be having a huge impact for these patients too. And I don't necessarily think that that's always being asked about either. Um, so it's another kind of perhaps red flag symptom to at least cover, kind of think about. And we know if you've got, if you've got, the reality is the airway is, as you keep saying, Rachel, is it's one area of the body and it controls your breathing and your voice and your swallowing. And all of those things are so interrelated that it is very difficult to unpick sometimes what the root cause is. And maybe that doesn't matter so much as recognizing that they are all interrelated and that one being knocked off will potentially have an impact on the others. And it's a really fine balance um, for patients and professionals to kind of get right and to, to fully like understand, but that we do our best work with the patient and with our MDT colleagues. And that's where we can probably kind of do better, I think, for long COVID and for the, the hospital population as well. Absolutely. And I think just wanted to kind of make sure that we also recognise, I think like Lorna mentioned right at the beginning about that, that, that kind of additional um, issue of kind of the emotional side, the kind of the stress related side, because I think some of what we, some of the symptoms we're talking about are linked to that kind of tension and whether that tension's got a link with, um, you know, it purely the kind of the laryngeal kind of airway issue, or is it, you know, the exacerbation of kind of lockdown and worrying about the COVID and when is it, when is this long COVID going to end or what is the impact going to be for me for work and et cetera, and just kind of really highlighting that as well. I just wondered um, sort of other people's thoughts on just that, that, that kind of emotional stress related factor and whether you, you, you get a sense that that is also something that may be getting missed or nece isn't necessarily being given clients that education of that connection with some of their symptoms. Fiona, what are your thoughts on that? I just want to kind of what you've been saying. I was going to say, I've referred a lot of people or asked people to self refer to our um, in independent therapy and um, psychological IAPT. Um, and I know lots of people, it's, it's a chickens and eggs thing. It's the whole, were they stressed before because of getting COVID and then the situation, then they got COVID and exacerbated it. I have found an interesting bunch of people, though, a population of people who perhaps would describe themselves as being fairly laid back and not that stressed about it, but are still getting these sort of stress type breathlessness issues, which is what's made me err on the side of thinking, this is more a physiological stress that COVID has put the body under. I know talking to one of my phys uh, physio colleagues, he was talking to me about the idea of metabolic stress, where some of these COVID patients can no longer tolerate drinking alcohol because the rising metabolic sort of reaction of having alcohol plus the, the COVID is causing this metabolic stress. And I know some people have said they, they can't tolerate alcohol at all, which is, is interesting. So I've mm -hmm. sort of been thinking it, it's a bit of both, but I'm, I'm erring on the side of thinking COVID itself, physically having COVID puts your body under a huge amount of trauma. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, those psychological therapists, uh, therapies in the community, I've been relying on a lot and asking patients yeah. to refer. I don't know what Lorna has been finding. Well, my, my patients, thankfully, are in the position where they can get fairly quick access to psychology through our MDT. But I think the other, there's another couple of things to consider in terms of the stress is just 
the whole stress of lockdown that we've had on the whole population. And I know I've got certainly quite a lot of non-COVID voice patients who I'm seeing who are presenting with incredibly um, high levels of stress because they've had a year often on their own to think about things and things that they've maybe, maybe been too busy to sort of think about and remember, et cetera, has been, have all come to the fore. So there's, so there's that level of lockdown as well. And the other thing that was discussed quite early on in our MDT actually is, I'm not quite sure where the figures came from, but in terms of, you know, we know that cancer patients have fear of recurrence, but a lot of these patients have a huge fear of getting COVID again and what it's gonna to do to them now. Whether that will fall with the vaccines rolling out, who knows? But it also it affects how they live their lives quite dramatically, um, because they're so scared that if they get it again, it's you know they might not survive it the next time, even if they didn't have it very, um, you know, very significantly the first time. Look what kind of symptoms they've got off the back of it. Um, so there are huge emotional issues um, mm -hmm. under a lot of the things that we're seeing. I think. Yeah, totally agree. And I think it's, it's yeah, it's, in, it's interesting that you talk about the kind of the non-COVID, the sort of non-COVID ones that are coming through as well, because, you know, the stress is happening to everyone. And then, it's, then we've got this kind of pocket of people that have got that plus the COVID issue. We've got people that have just got, it's got that and it's still, it's still having an impact. So, yeah, it is something to consider. And I think, um, you know, just exploring what connections people's services have to psychology when when speech and language therapists are having these conversations, just making sure that they do kind of remember that side of things and kind of think about what, where they're able to signpost people to. I think that's a really important factor because I've, there's been a few that I've seen as well who have then continue to build up this kind of strain and kind of, you know, so over the course that, you know, some, some kind of worsening of symptoms and you're, and you're kind of wondering, you know, had had you seen someone to talk to, would would some of this not have even happened? Kind of thing, you know. Is this? It, I think some people have had more time to think about their symptoms by being at home and being, you know, that that is a factor as well. I think we have to sort of kind of point out that you know, being being in lockdown, people have a bit more time to kind of reflect on things that they may have previously just carried on working, carried on with life. Um, but at the same time, I think because they've been they've had that time to kind of internalize what's happening to me how is this different to before we we do have that kind of role to kind of not leave it and kind of try and sign place where we can to, to other services i think also there's the um the factor of the unknown um as a as a sufferer of long covid myself um you know i recovered within 10 days and went back to icu and was working full time and managing just fine and then five months later, I'm developing quite significant breathlessness symptoms, which is now ongoing. And in, you know, in the absence of any sort of identifiable changes on my lungs and normal sit to stand test, it's still an ongoing issue. And I don't know when and if that's going to recover. And I think for a lot of patients, it's this unknown trajectory of long COVID. We don't have the data on that. We don't know what this is going to look like for these patients in six months time, in a year's time, in two years time. And I think that in itself, speaking from personal experience, also adds to that level of anxiety. Um, mm. I don't know what we do about that because nobody has the answer. Um, so it's a bit of a waiting game, which which can be quite stressful at times. No, it's, it's because we need to fit everything into a medical model that has, that can be seen and it's a diagnosis. And the thing with long COVID is a lot of these symptoms um, can be made up to some degree. Um, and we know that people don't want to feel like this. You don't want to make these things up. It's about validation and people being believed and, and then saying, if you get the therapy, these things will get better. And I think there's just the disconnect there between how people get the therapy and what type of therapy they need. So the more conversations we have as professionals, so as people across, you know, not sticking in more silos, talking to each other, crossing those professional boundaries that we do, I think we do do, but maybe not to the extent. And that's what we need to continue in the multidisciplinary model. And for me, even it's completely unrealistic and unachievable to think we're gonna have every professional in every clinic, in every part of the UK, 
in the next month to be able to solve this problem. But what we do need is to understand what exists within our localities, the referral pathways. If we haven't got that there now, what do we do? Who have we got? Have we got the Sharons we can refer into or part of an NHS enterprise to meet the needs? Because if we don't meet the needs, the social economic impact is huge. Um, and I think that for me is where it just highlights a lack of resource and I'm going to come around to everyone for the final comments because I'll never finish on the final say. Give you a second to think. My comments is if there's any commissioners out there, any consultants that run ICU clinics, that you need no more evidence that you need a speech and language therapist in those clinics as a full time job, not an hour here and there, not a clinic popping in new full time jobs, please, consultants, please. Um, the second thing is we need to somehow think in the future about how we can flex our research um, resource, Lorna. I mean, all of you have talked about how we can do that and be more flexible. We've got to learn from this silo, dysphagia, service, communication, whatever it is. Same for physios, same for OTs. And then how we can interlink up and share our skills and knowledge because as therapists, that's what we always want to do. So invest in the resource. Um, Sharon, I'm going to come to you first and then we'll just go around the screen. So Lorna, Avisha, Fiona and Gemma, then we're finishing. Sharon. Um, I think like my thought would be, you know, we don't always have to know why things are happening or be able to explain it. It's, you know, this is an ongoing thing that we're all learning as we're going along. So I think, you know, people, you know, therapists out there and things, it's, you know, just we do, we've got lots of skills that we just use what we know, what we have, even if we can't necessarily, I think, you know, Sometimes we kind of get bogged down in trying to understand why someone's presenting with this or why this is happening and just kind of, you know, just looking at that person in front of you, what they're saying, validating what they're saying, and then just kind of using the skills that you have to kind of do the best you can and signpost. So I think, yeah, you know, that it's, you don't have to understand it sometimes. You know, we, we just, we're all learning. Nobody quite sort of understands this kind of long COVID um, kind of condition to it in its entirety. Thank you, Sharon. Lorna? I think I would, I would echo that and echo what you were saying about not working in silos. It's about keeping talking to your colleagues who are working with these patients because we're all learning different bits from different from different specialities. And it was, I mean, it was um, what you said, Gemma, about the taste changes, etc., with the, with the head and neck patients. And with the head and neck patients, you can often give them a sort of timeline as to how things are going to get better. And what's really difficult with these patients is you can't give them a timeline as to how things are going to get better. So all you can do is try to keep as much on top of what's coming out. And that might be a nugget of information coming from one of your one of your colleagues that you wouldn't know if you don't talk to them. Thank you, Avisha. Um, completely echo what Sharon and Lorna have said as well. Um, we're dealing with still, you know, we've come a long way over 12 months in terms of our knowledge of the disease, but there's still a lot of unknown factors. And I think it's okay that we can we can say that to our patients as well. Um, but as long as we're listening to what they're what they're saying to us, we're normalizing their symptoms and trying to provide the best level of support that we can within what we know. Um, and really taking an MDT approach to their management um, and, and for them to be reassured that they can access services um, as and when they need and, and signposting them, safety netting them as best as we can. Thank you, Fiona. I suppose I want to um, encourage my colleagues. I'm well aware of the fact that they might watch this and think it's all well and good for some of you who work in big hospitals with lots of access to consultants. Um, lots of our colleagues will work in small community situations and perhaps be not sort of so closely allied to their medical colleagues. Um, I want to say to them to have, have courage and to trust their clinical skills and their clinical judgments because a lot of them will have experience, particularly in sort of voice. There is a lot of voice upper airways crossover. Trust that. It's fairly, fairly new anyway for speech and language to get involved in upper airways. It's only really since... 2015 that the Royal College produced their um, publication about that work that we can do. So it's fledgling, as everybody said, I completely agree, but trust yourself, go with your clinical judgment, go with your clinical instinct, instincts rather, and don't be afraid to throw your sleeves up and get involved. The good thing is a lot of the work we're doing, it's, it's not pharmacological, it doesn't have any side effects. And if anything, as Gemma said about self-efficacy, if you can appeal to the patient, support them, 
the outcomes are really good but trust yourself and and get stuck in I suppose is what I'd say don't be afraid don't be afraid of it thank you Gemma hard to go last um I think possibly two things actually one is that we're working with people not patients just to reframe the language that we use um and I think some of that relates to the fact that long COVID, everyone wants to be able to put it into a box and say, this is the symptoms you're going to get. And, you know, we don't know the timeframes, but from everything that I've read about it, and I'm sure that everything that everyone has kind of seen when they've seen patients, actually, there is no box and there is no sim single symptom profile. So talk to the person in front of you about what they personally are experiencing and respond as appropriate to that. Um, and as has already been said, use your colleagues. And I kind of prefer the phrase interdisciplinary team because I think MDT is still a bit too siloed. I think what we need to do is think about ourselves as a, as a kind of broad healthcare set of professionals who all bring expertise and skills and can give so much to the person with the symptoms that we're talking to. And especially if we connect all the docs and, and we talk to each other, um, and just one very last point is that patients, people get really tired talking to loads of different professionals about the same things. So if they've already seen your colleagues, be mindful that if you're having to go over old ground with them, that, that's quite frustrating and, and be considerate in terms of how you phrase all of that. Um, that would be my last couple of comments. Agreed. I think we all agree on all of that. The personalised care move through NHS England should see us allowing people to access healthcare for what matters for them and making their own personal choices, but we're just not there yet. And that's why to access healthcare, you have to be a patient. You can't be a person and a patient. And if COVID has taught us anything, sadly, it's that healthcare professionals too need to access health and social care. So I complete, I think that's a really nice concept to finish on Gemma and everyone, um, kind of what matters to us. And it might just not be what matters to the system as much. So it's our role as therapists to champion that in each other. So on that note, I want to say thank you very much for joining me. I've got no idea what time it is, everyone. It's 7.30 p.m. So we'll probably run over, but I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much.